Okay, so the only way that you are going to live down here successfully is to crucify the flesh. You cannot let a demon use your mouth, your eyes, anything. You cannot let him manifest. Witchcraft is a work of the flesh. An evil spirit needs a body to have expression. The only way he can get into the church is through one of us. And it's through false thinking, false doctrine. And Paul was a protector of that. Okay? All right, so the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And bringing into captivity, pulling down any high thing that exalts itself above the knowledge of God. It's bringing it into captivity, actually handcuffing it and arresting it. Taking it away. You have to label it and say, no, that is not a God. Yeah, like I said, this goes over real well all the time. Okay, so, all right. Romans chapter 8, verse 13. If you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if you by the Spirit put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. That's in the Bible. In Luke 9, 23, it says, Then he said to them all, this is on page 42 at the bottom, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Romans 13, 14 says, Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. Well, there goes greasy grace. Make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. So, you know, Paul already went through this once. He said, you know, so do I sin more because grace abounds? No. No. Like I said, it has 328 views. <laughs> Moving on to the word. The next power word is the word of God. This is a really good one, and, and you'll, you'll be excited about this one. Hey, by the way, um, I did a test just to prove everything I'm saying to you about uh, how people are. You know, they don't want to take their medicine. Um, I posted because um, what, what happened was is that I was asked to do these TV programs, and um, I didn't really realize what I was doing. I was just happy that somebody asked me to do it. It was in Farsi. should have been my first indication. And um, so I did these programs, and um, afterwards, the Iranian pastor who took the Koran and the Bible and became a Christian, comparing the two. And then his whole family converted, and then he went to the school we all went to, and now is a pastor. So he, he filmed me and went on TBN, on, in the Jot Network, and he came up to me afterwards. He says, congratulations, there's now a price on your head in Iran. You'll never be able to go to Iran. I go, what? He's patting me on the back, smiling. So my face, with a price tag, is in Iran. Because I preached the gospel into Iran on satellite. So you know, you know how like everything's fine because it's really cool being a Christian and a minister and you know, everything's cool until, um, you know, I mean there's money on your head. And, you know, those guys come over here, you know. <laughs> and they're, they're driving your taxi cab, you know. And you, do you know what I'm saying? Okay, so, you know. No, you guys don't get this. Do you? Okay, all right, so. 
So at this point, now listen, I have something I have to make a decision on. Am I really, really a Christian? Am I really willing to die for Jesus Christ? And because I looked into his eyes in person, he's worth it. Okay, so I put out a post because of the fear that I felt. Because I really feel, you know, I have to be very careful. And so there's certain countries that I don't even go near. And I had to make a decision. So what I did was I thought, you know what, I'm going to, uh, because I'm not afraid to die, because I've already done that, I would make a post on Facebook. And I said, and most of you have probably seen it, it, said, it says, I just want you to know that I am a Christian and that it would be considered an honor to die for him. I got three likes. <laughs> you want to know why? Because those Islamic terrorists, they, they see that, and they're making a list of everybody that likes it. So the only three were three people from that pastor's church who had converted and know what the price is. They had to escape Iran through Turkey, get on a jet, and fly to Canada and then wait for the um, Americans to give them access to the United States, okay? They know the price. Their families are still there. They're hiding. Okay, so I get three likes. So then what I did is I found a picture of Bambi in the grass, and I, you might have seen this. I put that out. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. With a picture of Bambi sleeping in the grass. It was 380 likes. Case dismissed. Okay, do you understand what I'm saying? So it's the same with this stuff. You know, um, really, 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 Jesus is worth dying for, and it's, it, it won't hurt. You won't even feel the pain. But, you know, the life we live down here is not our own. And we're supposed to glorify God in our body, but we have to go on to something happy here. So chapter 7, the Word of God. So shall... Shall, so shall my word that goes forth from my mouth, it shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing from which I sent it. Now, in this power word, this is another word that is being extracted, and it's the word of God. Do you know how many sermons I've listened to of a, a man who has 60,000 in his church? And in a sermon, he never mentions Jesus' name. He says, God. But see, the word of God is a person. Oh, I don't want to tell him that. Lord. Okay, I won't. I won't do that. 1 Samuel 3.1 says, Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord before Eli, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were infrequent. Okay, so Samuel is born, and he is dedicated to the Lord by his mother, placed in the temple to live there forever. Well, I mean, not forever, but to, to, to be there and... Um, he didn't leave. Okay. At this point, do you want to take a break? Are we good? Okay. Um, everybody good? If we do a break, the problem, the reason why I don't, I'm doing this at other places, but I'm not doing it here, is, is if we do a break, it's it's just gonna, no one's going to get to go to the bathroom. It'll be like a being on the e ride at Disney World. It'll be you know two hour wait. So. Just get up and go when you do. I, I, I'm not afraid if you're offended. If, you know, if you, I'm not, I don't think you're offended if you get up to go to the bathroom. So you, that's my point. Okay. So the, Samuel grew up in the, the statue and the admonition and the fear of the Lord, and he was quiet. And so the Lord called him one day, and the word of the Lord was rare, but the word of the Lord started coming to him. He heard 
his name being called. And he went to Eli and he said, listen, you called me, what do you want? He said, well, that's not me. And it, you know how the story goes. So finally, Eli realizes that the Lord's calling him. So he says, listen, the next time that you hear this, just say, speak for your servant here that's listening. So that happens and the Lord appears to him. Now, what, what is interesting is that it was so rare in that day to have to get to hear the word of the Lord and visions and things like that. But what, look what happened. It says at the end of Samuel's life that not one word that he spoke as a prophet fell to the ground. But it was because he separated himself and his environment caused him to, to be able to receive the word of the Lord without being influenced in any way. Everything good? Okay, all right. So this is what I, I, wanted, I wanted to share with you about the word of the Lord, is that, that um, most people, when you listen to them speak, they're not speaking from the glory. They're speaking from the outer court or worse. <laughs> And uh, you, you, but please, I'm, I'm not being mean because I grew up in a church that never told me I need to be born again, and they read from the Reader's Digest. And I was going to hell because my pastor never told me that I need to be born again. And I can get the uh, Reader's Digest myself, but I was tithing 75 cents a week. That was my tithe since I was 10 years old. I was there twice a week. Every time the doors were open, my parents were involved. My dad was on the board. My mom was the janitor. And I would go up in this sanctuary and pray. And I would put my 75 cents in the envelope every week. And then um, as we sang, Just As I Am, we put it in the in the the Presbyterian bucket, you know, and everything. I didn't know that I was going to hell because I was told if I join the church and if I behave, you know, I would go to heaven, possibly, if God's in a good mood that day. But it really wasn't up to him because it was Peter at the gate. And he had this, you know, list. <laughs> anyway. So do you understand my resistance to people that are spirit-filled and even a prophet who never talks about the Word of God but talks about, well, I'm not going to even say anything because then I'll, you know, I'll identify these people. I can love them and they're my friends, but I want a plate that is hot steaming from the throne of God. I want a hot meal. And I want to thus saith the Lord. And I really want to be from the Lord with a capital L. And um, I don't want somebody telling me something that I already know. I want somebody that can tell me what I dreamt last night and then interpret it. So that's why I don't, I don't you know, when I prophesy, it comes to pass, but I don't prophesy that much. Because I know things, but I'm still learning. But I, I'd rather be, be quiet than be wrong. Because it's a sacred thing. And this reroutes people's lives by what you say. And if I prophesy that Velma is supposed to marry this guy and he's a criminal, well, guess what? I'm responsible for that. Velma's better off just being alone. <laughs> so the word of the Lord uh, came to Samuel, and he was a mighty prophet. And you know that he anointed David, which is a type of Jesus. So he came from David's lineage. And it's just so cool how the Lord used him all his life because the word of the Lord came. His mother knew it. Same with Samson. An angel appeared to his mother and told him, this, this man, this person in your womb is, is, is going to be one who is going to war with the Philistines. And um, it's, he's going he's gonna to really literally 
uh, release the people of God from the Philistines' rule. Right? He's a deliverer. Okay, so every time there's a deliverer in the womb, the word of the Lord comes. You know, we have Moses and even Jesus. So the deliverer is in the womb. The deliverer now is, is, is our Jesus Christ, the word of God. And the word of God, when, when I met him, there was no difference between his word and him. He, it was the same. So when he said something, it, there was no difference between his word and who he was as a person. And then I saw, as I met people up there, that I didn't meet on the earth but I got to spend time with them, mighty men of God. Their word was the same as who they were, and I realized the discrepancy down here and why this, this principle and this, word, this power word, why we need to bring it back is that the word of God is a person, and we should be a people not only of the word of God, but of our own word. That there shouldn't be a difference between who we are and our word. That's why people don't trust. And that's why they have a hard time taking God at his word because they're so used to the word not being who the person is. People renege on their word. But it says to honor your word even to your own hurt. Now, the reason I'm telling you all this and why I picked this is because everybody wants to know. One of the number one questions I get is, why did my, not, my mountains not move when I speak to them? And I have to tell them, well, you've cried wolf too many times. Your words have been diluted by the fact that there's a difference between who you are and what you say. So your words, it's better to be quiet. If, you'll, if, if, if you're around me, all my, you know, like my, the people that are around me, um, and when I'm different places, you know, the pastors know that, it's, that I have to be quiet right before I come out. I, I spend a couple hours in prayer, and then I lock in with the Holy Spirit, and then I come out, and I, I say hi to Pastor Wayne, and I go right into my message. I don't talk about myself because the anointing will leave, and, and the Holy Spirit will go over there and wait until I'm done talking about myself and my book table <laughs> and you know, all my accomplishments and who I know. And so you get this whole thing for 20 minutes. Then you have an hour-long offering. You have an hour-long offering? And so I can't go to these meetings with these people because, you know, I already determined my heart before I go what I'm going to give so I'm not under compulsion. So while they're, while they're messing with me for an hour, and my wallet, it's really weird. My wallet's like being pulled out supernaturally. It takes an hour. So I tell my wife, I'm serious, and you would know all these people that I'm talking about, but I... I tell my wife, okay, this is what we're giving in the offering as we're getting dressed to go. <laughs> I pray in tongues. The Lord tells me what to give, and that's it. That is it. I'm not talking about the tithe. That's not mine. Did I say that? Because well, yeah, it's... Oh, no, here we go. I have to tell you this. The, the tree in the garden, that was God's tree. It was put in man's garden, but that's God's tree. The tithe was never yours. Now, don't get mad at me. Just when you get to heaven, you, you'll find this out and say, you'll have to come find me and apologize. But the, the 10% was never yours. And I don't care... Do not waste time with me. Because Melchizedek received tithes from Abraham before Moses. Besides, I can't find anything better than having the heavens opened up 
where I can't even find enough storehouses. And God rebukes the devourer for me. I don't even have to leave my house. If you can find something better than that, but I have, it's 30%. <laughs> and then the 50%, and then here's the favorite one, the $50,000 test. And when I was told to do that with someone who doesn't like me, I said, well, you got to tell my wife. And I knew, oh, she's, she's on the treadmill working out. She'll never, she'll never hear that. <laughs> so I did. She was on the treadmill in my office. And I said, I said okay, God, you tell her. $50,000 is a whole year's salary. But I had to pass that test. So I said, Kathy, I said, uh, what are we going to give so-and-so? Because the Lord's telling me we got to give him something. And he's giving me a figure. And then you tell me um, what you get. So she's on the treadmill. She's got her Bible open. And she's, she's burning calories without even leaving the house. It's amazing. So she gets off the treadmill and pats her head. She goes, it's $50,000. I go, oh. <laughs> So we gave that to the person. And now they like us. can't use that anymore now. Okay. So, where was I anyway? I know, but why was I saying all that? Okay, the tree. You see that anointed cherub that was over Eden? When he saw man, he looked like God, but he didn't. And then when God would come down, he would walk with the man, but he wasn't visiting the cherub. That's how special we are. But Satan, who was Hillel at the time, he was a cherub, Hillel, bright and shining one. He had nine stones in his breastplate instead of 12. God left three out. It's called, in the government, it's called compartmentalization. When you're working on top secret projects, you don't get all of it. You get a part of it so that you can't ever sell out all of it. So if you read how many stones he had in his breastplate, there was nine. The priest had 12. One of the ones that's missing out of Lucifer or Halal's breastplate is the stone that represents Issachar, which is the ability to interpret the times. So what he does is every time he suspects a deliverer in the womb, he takes out two or three years worth of babies. Is anybody here? What did he do when Moses was in the womb? He, he went into Pharaoh and had him knock out two or three years, right? When, when the, when the uh, wise men saw the positions of the stars and the deliverer was in the womb, what did Herod do? Okay, so now we're, we're nearing the last generation and there's, there's prophetic voices in the womb. What does Lucifer do? He legalizes abortion. And makes you pay for it. Not, not so much anymore. But do you understand what I just said? He doesn't, in, he doesn't know how to interpret the seasons and the times. So the Tower of Babel was built to contact the heavens, not reach them. That word there in Hebrew is to contact. The positions of the stars has order in it. The angels that were fallen, they don't get their briefings from God anymore. They have no access to the command center. So they're trying to figure out where we are in the scenario because angels don't understand time. 
That's why they created the horoscope and the mediums and witchcraft. What they do, I know this is going to help you. What they do is you go to a witch, you go to a medium, and they have a familiar spirit that stands beside them. As soon as you give yourself over and sit down with them, that evil spirit goes and finds the spirits that are assigned to their family because they're all assigned to lineages, bloodlines, and they enforce curses. That's why you act like your dad and your grandfather and you're trying to beat it. And then that spirit comes back and it tells the medium information. So they'll tell you your mother's name. And then you tell that medium, well, I know my mother's name. Because I've had evil spirits do that. And I, we know people have had evil spirits. Well, I know your mother's name. They go, well, I know my mother's name. <laughs> Are you ready for this? Then, because you've submitted to that authority, they will say something to you. Well, you're going to die of cancer in two years. If you accept it, that spirit goes out and gets a spirit to put that on you. You're going to die in a car crash, or you're going to have a crash. And then it happens. They tell you what day it's going to be. They, all they're doing is making it happen based on what the witches say. Is everybody following what I'm saying? Yeah. So when the word of the Lord comes, it is stating the absolute intent of God for you. However, in the New Testament, it's conditional because everything is based on trust. So when you receive a word, a prophecy, Paul said to Timothy, you wage war with the prophecies you've received. You have to actively say them, and the angels are doing them. They're enforcing what came forth. It doesn't automatically happen because it's conditional based on your engagement in the spirit realm. You see, New Testament prophets are not like the Old Testament prophets because what you say is not going to be written in a new book in the Bible. You're speaking forth the word of God, his intent. You're building up the body. It's words of exhortation. A prophet is supposed to confirm what you know. You know something, and the Lord calls you out and says, the prophet says, thus saith the Lord, and confirms it. But, if, but the reason why, I just want you to know, if you, if you knew me before, I had words all the time. It was freaking me out. I mean, so accurate. And it backed, the Lord told me to back off. And that's how I learned what I just told you. I said, why? He says, because my people aren't seeking me, and I, I have nothing to confirm. And then I realized the New Testament prophet is supposed to be confirming the results of you seeking God and needing a confirmation. So I know things about each one of you, but I can't say it because you don't know it. Only if God tells me do I, I call people out. Uh, but I know things about each person. If they come close to me, I know. And I know what's wrong, and I know what you need to do. But see, it's not my job to tell you that. Oh, boy, this is going over well. <laughs> Dear Lord. So that's why, that's why I have a problem with someone who's always prophesying over, I always have words for people. 
And you know, as I'm listening to them, they're not even right. That's why I don't even, like, Second Timothy chapter two, verse three and four. You must endure hardship as a soldier, good soldier of Christ. Page 46 at the bottom. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, but that he may please him who has enlisted him as a soldier. Paul is talking about a Christian. Second Samuel 23, 1. Now, these be the last words of David, David the son of Jesse, and the man who was raised up high, the anointed of God of Jacob, and the sweet psalmist of Israel said, The Spirit of the Lord spoke by me, and his word was in my tongue.